My name is Drew, and man, I live in San Antonio, Texas, uh, which is a lot warmer there than it is here. And, um, but I live there with my wife and our two kiddos. We have a five-year-old and a almost three-year-old. Tomorrow will be my son Lyndon's birthday. And so, yeah, very cool. So we've, I guess, figured it out. Um, but yeah, man, it's such a huge honor to get to be here with you today. And so whether you're in this space or you're part of another campus online or Deer Lodge, man, it really is such a joy. Um, Man, we love, love, love your pastors and believe that Pastor Levi, Pastor Jenny, I mean, just their vision, their leadership is just unparalleled. And what God is doing here um, is, I mean, it's literally echoing and rippling, not just across our nation, but throughout the world. And so, uh, yes, so they're... Oh, so grateful. Uh, also, Pastor Levi is just so cool. Like everything about him is cool, um, which is frustrating. Um, but, and we, man, I feel like in just the little bit of time that I've gotten to be a part of the Fresh Life family, I felt just deep connections. And uh, man, I feel like this really is family. Uh, I joked earlier uh, with Pastor Kyle when we were here last time, uh, he told me that I was his new best friend and said that we would start going on vacation together and he never called me. Uh, so, but I'm still waiting on it. It's going to happen. No, like all jokes aside, we're gonna make it happen. Uh, it does feel the same. So, well, uh, I, let's just dive in. I'm gonna just kind of, I wanna pray for us and then we'll get into God's word. Cool. Jesus, in these next few moments, um, I just pray that you would speak really loud and clear. And I don't wanna step into this moment pretending that I know where Man, everyone is on their spiritual journey, but you do, and you care deeply. And so, Jesus, would you whisper to their hearts, maybe in a language that's unique to them, that, that they could understand? And uh, yeah, may we leave this place forever changed because of you and nothing else. Let's do me pray. Amen. Well, if you have a copy of your scripture, and I hope you do, I'd love for you to turn with me to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. As you turn there, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, In 2014, uh, I was not yet married. I was dating a girl named Jane who would eventually become my wife. And we, things are kind of, I guess, starting to get kind of serious, but she had never seen uh, me on the road, never gotten to come hear me like teach or uh, perform. And so we were like, hey, I feel like if we're going to like take a next step, that might be good for you to kind of see my life on the road. And so uh, we were living in Washington State at the time, and I was doing something in Nashville. We have tons of friends there. So she flew out and met me in Nashville, and we did like a two-day conference. And at the end of the conference, uh, we were going to we get a chance to fly back together to Washington. And we head early in the morning to the airport. And if you've ever been to BNA or National Airport, there's this huge sign as soon as you walk the doors with all the locations that uh, they're flying to that day. And so I was like, Jane, question, just for fun, if you could pick any one of those places, where would you want to go? And she said, uh, New York City. Now, I knew that New York City was her favorite city in the world. And so I was like, hey, surprise, I rerouted us. We're actually going to New York uh, for a couple of hours to hang out. I thought that'd be fun before we head home. And so immediately she begins to kind of tear up and cry, which as a guy, you're like, yes, this is already, (laughs) it's working. We're moving in the right direction. So we go go through security, we get on the plane and uh, we take off. And the moment we take off, I reach into my bag and I pull out an envelope. And on the envelope was a huge number one written on it. And I hand it to her. And she's like, what is this? I was like, open it up. She opens it up, pulls out a postcard. Now, when through our dating relationship, every place that I would visit, even like today, I would have gone and gotten a postcard somewhere. And on on the back, I would just write a prayer for our relationship, something that I was thinking about processing in that season. And I'd held all of these and I had about about 30 of them uh, that were in my bag. And so every 15 minutes, I would pull one out, hand it to her, she'd open it up, we'd read it and talk about it. And uh, so yeah, that was, we land in New York City, there's a car that's waiting on us and it just takes us immediately into Manhattan so we can grab a piece of pizza uh, because I know that Jane's favorite food is pizza and no one does it better 
than New York City. And so we grab a piece of pizza, we head closer to Central Park. And what I'd done is I had booked a hotel room, okay? Now just real quick for you, not, not for us, uh, but for this purpose here. Ladies, follow me. You know, typically, if you've got one of those early morning flights, let's say like 6 a.m., you're not showing up to the airport necessarily like photo ready, okay? You might be rocking a side pony and some sweats. So I was like, hey, I got this just for you. You feel free, go upstairs. Uh, the room's yours, get ready, take your time. I'll meet you in the lobby. So she heads upstairs, walks into the hotel room. There's flowers waiting on her and these postcards that are just there so she can read while she gets ready. She gets ready, comes down, and we just kind of walk through the city, grab coffee. We're talking about our relationship, dreams, hopes for the future. We find ourselves in Central Park and we have, we have a, a seat and a bench. And uh, I hand her the, I was like, this is the last one. She opens it up and she pulls out a postcard from New York City in Central Park, the photo taken from where we were seated, kind of the ponds and the bridge and overlooking the city. She flips it around and says, this one's from all over the world. I pull out my phone and I hand it to her and I had created a video of all of our closest friends and family from across the world just speaking a blessing over our relationship. And then when it was done, I put my phone in my pocket and pulled out a ring and went down on one knee. And for the very first time in our relationship, I told her I loved her, okay? Those words meant something to me and I wasn't gonna say them until I could back them up. And I asked her if she'd be willing to spend the rest of her life with me. And obviously she said yes, uh, or I, thank you, <laughs> did it. Otherwise I wouldn't be telling that story. Um, and so you might be like, okay, Drew, cool. What's the point? What's the point? Uh, one, um, just out here trying to raise the bar for guys. And so <laughs> fellas, if you're here and you're not yet married, um, step it up. Yeah. And uh, also here, just, just a word of encouragement. None of that is copyrighted. So all you gotta do is find a girl who's not in the room and you can use as much of that as you'd like, okay? It's yours, take it. Uh, but second, I want you to see this, okay? So we have this moment and then we get on a plane, we fly back to Washington, we immediately start planning our wedding. And a couple months later, we would find ourselves with all of our friends and family uh, all together celebrating our relationship and Jane walks down in white through like, you know, just the aisle, stands on this altar next to me. And we make these, these promises that I'm, I'm now yours and, and you're now mine. And that my, my, my life, it doesn't revolve around me anymore. You're, you're a new priority and I'm willing to, to go where you go and to, and to do what you like. I'm with you till death do us part. And then we celebrated the night away with our closest friends. And at the very end of the night, uh, like we were like on a football team, you know, we went through a hallway of sparklers and we get to the end of that, that little hallway. And I want you just to imagine for a second that if we would have gotten to the end, all of our people behind us, and if I were to look at Jane and I would have been like, you killed it out there. Good game, you know? Uh, and then I just walk over and get in my car. See you next week. And she goes and gets in her car and we just go to our separate apartment. Like something in you, is even I say that, you're like, mm-mm, they don't, don't like that. That doesn't feel right. Like that's, if you're married, you're like, that's not how it went in my wedding. If you're not married, you're like, it's not gonna happen like that in my wedding, okay? And here's, here's why. Because every one of us knows that no matter how amazing the engagement story is, and ours is pretty phenomenal, if I do say so myself. <laughs> And no, and no matter how beautiful the wedding, neither of those are the point. The point is what you do after those things. The point is how do you, the, the life that you're starting together, like what you do from that moment forward. And I share that because I think for so many people in the Western church, how this plays out is we do the exact same thing we, with Jesus. We, we have these big mountaintop moments with these big experiences. And it's like we, we, we come to, to, to church and, and maybe we lift our hands and we have this great celebration. And then it's like, we walk out together with Jesus and we're like, man, high five, good game. You killed it out there, Jesus. See you next Sunday. 
And we go and we get in our car and that's kind of it. And we come back here for another experience. Great job. Same time, same place. When what if I were to encourage you today by saying, I think there's so much more. I think we're invited into a lot more. And my fear is that we may miss it. And so in Colossians, the Apostle Paul is writing this handwritten letter to a church that missed it. They'd gotten wrapped up in all of the, the cultural rhetoric, and they were starting to kind of lean more into the theology found in TikTok or Instagram or social, like, social media more than they were actually what Jesus said in his word. They were listening to the culture. They're starting to think that maybe Jesus isn't sufficient. Maybe there's got to be more, and that more is built on me. And maybe if I could, could perform well enough, if I could jump through enough religious hoops, if I could check all the right boxes, then somehow, some way, that God would be happy with me. And then based upon my performance, it feels like God is either distant, but if I'm really good, maybe he's close. But it's really all on me. And what Paul is writing, he's like, no, 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 I... I need you to, I'm going to pull back the curtain and I want you to, sh- I want to show you the secret to all of this. I want you to see truth. I want you to see ultimate reality. And this is so good. So Colossians 1, uh, starting in verse 24, this is what Paul says. He says, now I rejoice in my f- sufferings for you. And I'm completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. Okay, now pause real quick because I don't want you to get this twisted. Well, Paul, he's not saying this because a lot of times we can misinterpret this as like, hey, what happened is that Jesus shows up on the scene and he kind of gets the ball halfway down the field. And then Paul has to kind of step in and take it the rest of the way. That's not what Paul's saying. Like he's saying, hey, What Jesus did is all sufficient. Nothing else needs to be added. Like it is finished when Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the grave. But there are so many people that have not yet heard about his love, that have not been impacted by his life. And by God's grace, me being in prison and me suffering is actually an agent to where the story is spreading like wildfire throughout the Roman Empire. So that's what he's saying, okay? Uh, Verse 25, he says, I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Verse 26, the mystery hidden, which mm, just like, there should be a little bit of intrigue and curiosity that builds right there. They're like, ooh, there's a mystery. There's a secret he's about to tell us. What is this? Like we're listening, Paul. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles, that would be anyone non-Jewish, the glorious wealth of this mystery. And then it's like, oh, should be leaning in. What's he gonna say? Here it goes. He's like, this is the secret. This is the mystery. This is the point of all of it, just so you don't miss it. Here it is. He said, the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with the strength that works perfect or powerfully in me. So here's what he just said. He said, I want to boil it down. I want to give you the secret to this mystery. I want to show you what all this is about, the whole story, where it's all headed, what the whole point of. And he says this, he says, the secret is this, that for whatever reason, the moment that you and I, when we take our lives and we push all the chips in, And when we step off the throne of our lives, say, Jesus, I want you to be king. I want you to be captain. I want you to take leadership. That in that moment, that for whatever reason, the God of the universe, 
The God that spoke the world into existence and holds the cosmos in his hands, that God chooses to take up residence inside of you and me. (laughs) What? Are you kidding me? No way. And sadly, we hear that and we're so underwhelmed. Oh yeah, big deal. Yeah, 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 I know, I know, Drew. Like, we, we've all heard this. Like, we, know, we know the stories. Well, maybe we grew up in church. We've been to vacation Bible school. We know the songs and the hand motions. Je- Jesus is deep, deep down in our heart. Spell it. Like, you know, we know, we're good. <laughs> but I want you just to pause for a minute and think about that. That as followers of Jesus, what we are claiming to be true, what the scripture is pointing to, that the moment we say yes, that the fullness, not just like little parts, like the fullness of God's presence now lives and dwells inside of you and I. That the exact same power that took Jesus out of the grave and brought him to life now like courses through your veins. And if that's true, Think if we just be real honest for a second, then what's the difference between those of us in this room that claim to know and love Jesus and then our not yet believing neighbor? You know what it is, honestly? You know, well, we cuss a little bit less, don't drink quite as much, we watch a few less radar movies, And we have this committee meeting on Sunday morning that we have to go to. That's about it. Same fear. Same anxiety. Same divorce rate. Same stress levels. Not much more kindness or love or peace or patience, gentleness, self-control. I mean, you name it. So is this true? Or do we believe it's just a cute metaphor? It's just a philosophy, Drew. It's just an idea. Because if it's true, this changes a lot. So I want you just to think about it. Go back, go back with me. Okay, and I'll help us. And for whether we maybe grew up in church or not so much, like I think this will be helpful. I want you to think, go all the way back to the beginning of the book. The entire Old Testament was marked by by three words. Okay, if you could sum it all up, here it is. It was these three words, God with us. That, that That was the Old Testament. So if you think about it, just go with me here. You got, you had like God was with Adam and Eve. God was with Noah. God was with Abraham. God was with Moses. God was with the Israelites, cloud by day, fire by night. God was with King David. God was with the prophets. Even Jesus shows up on the scene and at Christmas time, we give him the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Very good. Now, but here's what's interesting. Jesus then goes to the cross, placed into a tomb, raises from the grave, then ascends to heaven. And All of a sudden, Paul's picking it up and he's like, hey, 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 this is where it gets crazy, guys. Everything's shifted with Jesus. Everything's changing for you and I. This is why Jesus would be like, oh, oh, it's actually better that I leave. He's like, well, no, 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 Jesus, you're here in the present. Like, what do you mean? It's not, it's no way it's better for you to leave. No, no, he's like, hey, no, it's crazy. You're not going to believe this. You're actually going to do way better, like bigger things than I did. I don't know if you read the book. Jesus does some pretty crazy stuff. And there's a promise. No, you'll do way more. Why? Because there's this massive shift here. It's no longer just God with us. It shifts to now Christ in us. Whoa. 
So for those of you that maybe you're more visual learners, I'll do it a different way because it'd be super helpful. Okay. Um, if you, uh, just real quick, if you were here last time I was here, this, you're, this is not a magic trick. Um, you'll be disappointed if you think it is. Uh, okay, but here's what I want you to do. This is helpful. Um, I want you to imagine that this, this water represents um, God's presence. Okay, like the manifestation. His presence is everywhere, but like the concentrated version of his presence, okay? And in the beginning of the scripture, we see this, that God is just in perfect relationship with himself, speaks the world into everything that we know and don't know. He creates with just his words, wild. He then reaches into the dirt, forms mankind, breathes life into man. Why? So that we could have a deep, intimate relationship with God. Like walk with him. Like be fully known, fully loved by him. And we make it three chapters into the book, screw it all up. So here it is. The garden the garden, this is presence, like, like that God would show up and he would walk with Adam and Eve and in the garden in the cool of the day. Like they, they could experience the fullness of his presence. But then when, when we rebel, that all of a sudden that relationship's fractured, it's broken. But the beauty of this is, is that God's not content leaving us on our own. He, wa- he wants to give us his presence. He knows it's, it's that the very source of life for us. So, uh, God would reveal himself to people throughout the Old Testament. And typically you would find out that God's presence was found at the mountaintops. And so if you think about like how Moses would go to Mount, Mount Sinai, okay? Or if you think about the woman who's uh, at the well, like she's like, uh, Jesus, uh, your people say that we worship on this mountain. We say we worship, on, where, where is it? Which is true, this mountain or this mountain? Now, when God rescues his people out of Egypt and carries them into the wilderness, God would give his people instructions to build a giant tent when they stopped and made up camp. They called it a tabernacle. And the moment that the tent was set up, that literally God's presence would descend and it would take up residence inside of the tabernacle. It would make its way with the people through the wilderness. Then all of a sudden, God's people would find themselves a permanent home in the promised land. And he would tell King Solomon that, 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 that the tent's not sufficient. We're going to build a permanent home for, for God. Like we're going to build a temple. And so all of a sudden, God's presence moves from the tabernacle into the temple. And this is where God's presence resides a majority of the Old Testament. And so anyone who wanted to get close and experience the presence of God, you'd, you'd have to go to Jerusalem to go to the temple, meet with God, go through the sacrificial system. Now here's what's crazy. When you turn the pages from Malachi into Matthew, Old Testament, New Testament, something radical happens because the presence of God, for whatever reason, chooses to wrap itself in human flesh and move into our neighborhood in the person of Jesus. That's who he was. He uses language, specifically in the book of John, where he's calling himself the new tabernacle. Now, Jesus walks on earth for 33 perfect years, teaching you and I what it means to be fully human and fully alive. And then he willingly willingly lays his life down on a cross. That was our cross, that was our death penalty for our treason against the high king willingly lays his life on the cross. All the punishment, do you and I, lands on Jesus. He goes into the grave, three days later walks out of the grave holding the receipts to sin and death. Ascends into heaven. So now, the million dollar question, where is God's presence? We're not in the garden. We don't have a temple tabernacle. Jesus, as much as we would love to, like he's not here in the flesh. Like we can't hug him. We can't physically touch him. So the, the, the manifest presence of God Almighty, where is it? It's here. It's in you, it's in me. 
This changes everything, church. May our hearts never get underwhelmed by this fact. I'll give you just a, some, a couple of like practical ways this plays out in case maybe we need help today. I want you to think about these implications. Whatever it is that maybe you walked into this room wrestling with, whatever doubts, fears, that maybe you walk into this space and, and maybe the question that drives you constantly is, am I safe? That could be physically, that could be emotionally. And so fear easily creeps into your story. For many of us, it's like a default setting. Then may you become overwhelmingly aware that the Lion of Judah not only pads alongside of you, he lives in you. What is there to fear? And maybe it's your question of security and anxiety and fear or worry cloud your thoughts and you feel, man, just insecure all the time. May you feel security today knowing that God, the God that owns a cattle on a thousand hills is closer than your skin. Maybe the question for you is, am I really loved or lovable? May you have the assurance today that God not only sees you and knows you, he loves you because Christ is in you. Or maybe it's, am I wanted? That today you would hear the spirit of God inside of you remind you that you were chosen before the foundations of the earth and he wants to be near you in the most intimate way. Maybe the question that you're constantly wrestling with is, am I successful? And you're, so you're constantly trying to prove yourself to the world around you. And may Christ in you remind you that you have absolutely nothing to prove and that God is already so proud of you. And he finds you worthy enough to dwell inside of you. Or maybe the question for you is, am I good enough? Constantly jumping through religious hoops, thinking that somehow, some way, you can earn God's attention or his affection. And knowing that Christ is in you allows you to stop performing for his approval and learn to just enjoy Christ in you. Or maybe for you, last one is like, do I have a purpose? Do I matter? And like I said earlier, the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the grave now courses through your veins and he is inviting you into an epic journey and he's given you everything you need to accomplish it. This is huge. It changes everything moving forward. And this is really important because listen, I think we have this tendency sometimes to hear a message like this and we're like, yeah, yeah, this is cool. Okay, Drew, could you give, some, give me like three steps to move forward? Or hey, is there an app that I can download on my phone that'll kind of help me doing this? And here's the deal. It's, this isn't, this is, there's no add on here. Christ in you is not an addition. This is not, it's not an app that you download. No, no, this is a complete operating system overhaul. Everything begins to shift. Everything begins to change when you see it through this lens. I'll give you just a few examples. Take something like a prayer, okay? When you really do start to believe that Christ is in you, like not, not just theoretically, like he's actually in you, then, then prayer moves from, from us you know, talking to an imaginary friend and, and trying our best to, I don't know, say the words just right to both impress our friends or somehow open up the incantation that then moves God through the sky like a genie. Yikes. Instead, it moves from your performance to actually being this regular heartfelt practice that helps us actually cultivate deep intimacy with Christ by allowing us to be honest 
and share our deepest needs, seek his guidance, but more importantly, to experience his presence. You know, sometimes like the best prayers are when we just shut our mouths. Like you got to think about this when we, we have, sometimes we feel this tendency just to, to fill the space and just to kind of talk and to use big words so that you, you are really impressed, right? With like how well I pray. Or here's the other thing. Sometimes we'll go, hey, like guys, we're all together and I'm going to call on you, sir, ma'am. Would you just, would you say a prayer for us? And we're like, Ugh, I don't know how to do that. You don't know how to do what? You don't know how to talk? No, I don't know how to pray. Ooh, ooh then we have somehow sold you that prayer is something that it is not. And prayer, when you think about this, like, you know, like if you jump in a road trip or like go on a little, like you jump in a car with someone and sometimes you feel this tension to just like fill the space. You just gotta like talk a lot. You gotta like, just feel this it's awkward silence. Like you just fill it. Do you know what that tells you about the relationship? that it's not that intimate. You're not that close. I get in the car with my wife and we'll go for a ride or a road trip. And, and sometimes there's like long periods where we say nothing. And we're totally content just being in each other's presence. May that become a regular practice for you with King Jesus, to learn to just sit with him, to be with him, and enjoy his presence. It's a big shift. Second thing, this, think like scripture reading. It moves from a, like checking off a task on your sp spiritual to-do list or feeling like you're cramming for some spiritual pop quiz that you don't ever know when's going to pop up, okay? Or it's like, a, you know, like I said, it's, just, it's, it's a religious hoop that you jump through. Two, watch this engaging a 66 book love letter written to you and I to tell you who you really are and for God to introduce himself to you so that the relationship can grow in intimacy. And then it's a giant invitation of how you and I now get to live so that we can live it to the fullest. Whoa. That'll change uh, your ritual tomorrow morning when you pick this up. Okay, God, like I'm, I'm, I don't want to just read to read. I'm not trying to just like store it. Like I'm asking you to speak to me. You promise that this is alive, that it's breathing, that the Spirit inspires us, and you can actually whisper to my heart through this book. So I'm listening. I'm ready, and I'm curious. Or take obedience. Obedience moves from somehow trying to earn God's approval to trusting Jesus and just aligning our will with his, going, God, I think you know what's best. And even though I don't see it, I say yes, because I love you. And because I love you, you get my yes. So here's the deal. A lot of times we think about obedience is we get it backwards. Um, we think if we're obedient first, then maybe that will stir love for Jesus or stir his love for us. And that's the equivalent of me going, hey, hey Drew, you, you and your wife, gosh, y'all look so happy. Give us the secret. And you're like, oh man, hey, listen, you know, do a lot of date nights. Uh, I buy flowers, you know, try to cook clean, you know, we hang out, make out, you know. Um, and you're like, oh, like, okay. Like, Drew, you do that because like you, you love your wife, you want to do that. And you're like, no. Actually, I, I don't like doing any of those things. I don't like hanging out with her. I'm not a big fan of date night. Um, I just do it because I read a book somewhere that said I'm supposed to. I'm not going to get me any points with my wife. But it's different when I go, no, no, I do those things because I know that she loves them. And because I love her, I step into that. It's a big difference to go, okay, Jesus, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to be obedient to you. No, why? Because I love you. And because I love you, I, I'm going to step into that. I'm going to trust you here. Or gosh, take worship. Worship moves from this oblig, or sorry, it moves from this like uh, Christian karaoke that makes us feel good emotionally 
to deepening our connection and intimacy with Christ and helping us focus on his greatness by reminding ourselves of truth and drawing strength from his presence. Ooh, that's a little different. Or, or maybe it's community. Community moves from this, like, I don't know, social awkward obligation or a solution to loneliness to stepping into relationships with our brothers and sisters in a journey to both offer and gain support, offer and gain encouragement, and then remind each other of who we really are when we get distracted. Whoa. Community now is not just a neat option, it becomes vital. Or service and giving, it moves from duty to an opportunity to let the love and power of Jesus Christ flow through your hands and feet in order to make the places that you live and you work and you play feel a little bit more like heaven. Dang, if I do say so myself. My encouragement, I wish so bad. Like I said, there's three easy steps or a to-do list. But strangely enough, the to-do list just totally voids everything I just said. <laughs> it just becomes more performance for you and I. So what if, for those of us in this room that really know and love Jesus and really have surrendered everything and we realize that Jesus, His presence lives inside of us. And we don't have to worry about him leaving us or him not being around. No, he's here. He's close. And we get to just foster the intimacy. We get to draw near. We get to be close because here's, this is so important. We don't grow in maturity of Christ by our performance. We grow because of proximity and time. Learning to sit with Jesus and go, okay, God, I'm gonna be in your word, but because I just want you to speak to my heart. I wanna be close to you. I'm gonna, yeah, let's sit in prayer because you want to know the heaviness of my heart and what I'm wrestling with and what I'm struggling for. But the second half of this, I just wanna sit with you and be with you. I wanna to listen to you. Do you have something you wanna to say to my heart? Like I'm, I'm listening and I'm not moving until you speak. And we're here today and yeah, we may lift our hands, we may stand, we may sing, but it's, these are just love songs to you to tell you how I see you and how I feel about you or maybe reminding myself on a hard day how I want to see and feel you. It's a journey and it's a wrestle. My wife and I, Two weeks ago, we celebrated 10 years uh, of being married. It's a <laughs> practically experts. So, um, and here's, I say this with all sincerity. I love my wife way more today than I do 10 years ago. Like I, she's truly my best friend. Like, I just love being with her. I love laughing with her. It's one of those like kind of silly, but you know, cliche, like finishing either sentences. sentences. Like I, I know oftentimes what she's thinking before she knows, like, like it's, it's, it's depth. And, but here's what's really cool. And I want you not to miss this. Like I, I'm no more married today than I was 10 years ago. I'm not more married. I'm the same married. But what's grown is my awareness of her presence. What's grown is our intimacy, our knowledge of one another, and that is what's made the journey sweet. E even today, I woke up this morning and man, for whatever reason, feeling kind of sensitive, there's some insecurity that's kind of setting in and I just, just the tension. 
Like I'm still recovering from being very much a people pleaser. And so if I'm not careful what happens in moments like this is that it's easy for me to step into this and going, hey, listen, what I want is you to like me so much. And my, my day is gonna be made or broken based upon some affirmation that you give me or you tell me that I'm enough. And so I'll get up here and I'll perform and I'll do whatever it takes to make you like me instead of being honest and, and doing what God's actually just asked me to do. And so I'm, I'm feeling that tension. I know it's a lie. And so I call my wife and she just begins to speak life over me, reminding me that, 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 that like I'm God's son. He calls me that. He whispers that over my heart, that he, that he loves me and that he's already proud of me before I ever step into this moment. And so because of that, I can step into this moment from a place of affirmation, not for your affirmation, because she knows me so well, because of proximity, and because of time together. May you, wherever you find yourself, give Jesus, like, I hate to say chant, it feels so weird. But would you, would you lean in? My prayer for you as that maybe the coming weeks, the coming months, maybe the summer, is marked by intimacy with Jesus like you have never experienced before. In such a way, that it changes everything about you. So Jesus, in this room, you know all the needs. And I just pray you, you really would, you'd overwhelm each individual person, whether it's in this space or it's another campus or it's online or Deer Lodge, would you, would your presence be just so thick wherever your people find themselves? And would you just invite them into deeper levels of intimacy? Would you let them know you're there, that you care? And would you empower them to live a life and a life to the fullest. Fresh Life, if you are, if you're here, and if you're real honest, you're like, hey, Drew, like this is cool and all, but I don't, I don't know Jesus. Like maybe I know a lot about him, but I don't like know him. And there's a huge difference. Like, listen, I know a lot about Michael Jordan. I do not know Michael Jordan. Like, do we know a lot about Jesus or do we actually know him as a relationship with him? Is he in you? And whether you're in this room or you're at the campus or you're watching online months from now or currently, if you sense Jesus whispering, he's like, yeah, yeah, like I want, the, come on in, the water's fine. Like I want, I want you to experience life and life to the fullest. And today something like, is like the alarms go off, you're like, I want that. Drew, I'm all in then today I just invite you wherever you find yourself to just pray alongside of me and to pray alongside this church. And just real quick, there's nothing special about these words. It's not a magical incantation. It's just the posture of your heart, of you asking to enter into a relationship with Jesus. He's a gentleman and he never forces his way into any relationship. So where you are, if this is something you want, pray along me in the church and just say, Jesus, I need you. I, I want to know you. I want to give you my life. And so I surrender everything and ask that you would live inside of me. Change everything empower me and help me to live the life you're calling me into. The scripture says that anyone who, gosh, goes from death to life, anyone who surrenders their life to Jesus for the very first time, that the scripture says that all of heaven throws a fat daddy party, something like that. Um, 
And so listen today, wherever you are online here, other campuses, Dear Lodge, if that was you, and you said yes, like I prayed that prayer for the very first time, we want to join in with heaven and to celebrate with you. So if you would, would you mind just slipping up a hand so that we can just celebrate alongside of you? I see you, yes, yeah, yeah. Across the campuses, online, Dear Lodge, we celebrate with you. We're so proud of you. The journey's just beginning. It's, it's just starting wherever you find yourself. Tomorrow is the first day of the rest of your life with Jesus. So enjoy it. Go for it. He's absolutely worth it. Fresh Life, thank you so, so much for letting me be a part.